Casey. Yes. Mr. Sorensen, just a few more questions. Okay. We, we saw your presentation here and all of the information that you used in a lot of <coughs> Conclusion this, in this case. Did you prepare an animation? Yes, I did. And what, is the, what was the animation based on? What did you use to create it? Basically, all of my testimony this morning. And, and would you tell the ladies and gentlemen what an animation is? I think the easiest way to describe it is I show, or we showed you the diagram of. Um, all of the cars and the like, the like uh, 0.3 seconds, the 0.8, etc. It was like a really long diagram that you couldn't really see all that well, but you could sort of make it out. It's sort of like taking the information from that, but turning it into a moving 3D diagram, if that makes sense. I think that's the easiest way that I can describe it. So I've taken the information from that I used to create that diagram, and I've set it to motion. Okay. And did you prepare an animation, um, two, two animations of the same thing, but in different time? Yes. Tell us what you, which, what you did. So I produced an animation um, using, in, in what I call real time. So I used the, the time uh, the calculated time for the larger tire size based upon the EDR data. So I remember it, I think, uh, well, this, it, it was going through about 3% faster. Um, I used the steering and yaw data, all of the stuff that I told you about this morning to create this animation. And then I believe that I also created one at half speed. So it just kind of slows things down because these things are over in a split second. Um, so your animation goes from 4.8 seconds prior to impact to impact? Uh, actually, to final rest. The final rest, okay. Yes. All right, thank you. We're going to play the one you call in real time right now. Okay, so uh, members of the jury, um, just a quick word about the animation that you're about to see. Um, the animation, is considered uh, what we call a demonstrative exhibit. And it's offered to illustrate this expert's version of the events. You should not view the animation as an actual recreation of the incident itself. Uh, so it's like all evidence. You may accept it or reject it in whole or in part and give it whatever weight uh, you deem proper. That's all the questions I have. Cross. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Good morning. Good morning. 
Um, so, um, with the animation, uh, part of your um, assumptions that you use to place the Tacoma have to do with uh, witness statements, correct? Correct. Um, and you use Ms. Farr's witness statement, correct? Yes. And so, uh, Ms. Farr, were you aware, said that she had passed the Volkswagen um, a mile or so before the impact site. Are you aware of that? I, I vaguely recall that. Okay. Do you recall that she said she passed two vehicles at that point? No. Mark is defendant's exhibit C. And uh, second And do you recognize what that is? Yes. And what is that? That is a report. Uh, looks like a, for an interview of Aaron Farr. Um, and could you uh, review? Uh, Second paragraph, so you can start in the first. Can you view that and tell me if it refreshes your recollection about Ms. Farr making a statement of passing two vehicles around the rest area of uh, the rest area of uh, I 89 prior to the impact site? Okay, yes. Okay. Does that refresh your recollection as that, that that's what she said? I, I, I didn't speak with her, um, but if, if this is what the detective, if what he's written down is correct, then sure. Your, your Honor, I, I would object to this procedure. He's showing him a document that he hasn't seen, and he's asking him to testify about whether it's correct or not. That is not his document. He didn't prepare it. It was another um, detective. Um, I could lay a foundation for this, Judge, if you would like me to. Um, a better one than I've already heard too much in open court. Sure. So you received information um, about statements made by Ms. Farr, is that accurate? 
Yes, I, th I think that it was uh, Sergeant Ballinger's report that I saw. I, I haven't seen that statement. So there's a report by Sergeant Ballinger, and in, in, in that report is a statement uh, from Ms. Barr? Um, yes. And do you recall whether or not, uh, Ben, from that report or any other information that uh, Ms. Barr said she passed two vehicles at the rest area? I, I don't remember that. All I remember is that um, she indicated that the vehicle was traveling the wrong way, it was in the passing lane. No, I'm talking about passing. Do you, did you get information that Ms. Barr said she passed the Volkswagen prior to the crash? I don't recall having that information. Did you have um, any information with regard to uh, other vehicles that may have been on the road, um, on the highway, at or around the time of the accident? Uh, I know that there were some other vehicles on the road, yes, but I believe that I think Ms. Farr's vehicle was the last one to pass uh, the defendant's vehicle just prior to the crash. Um, and where do you get, where do you get that information? I believe that was from Sergeant Ballinger's report. And uh, in your animation, um, uh, that you depicted that came from your data. Um, do you have any, can you tell us whether or not that there was a vehicle in the passing lane going southbound in those five seconds before the accident? I, I don't know. Could have been. Could have been, yes. But you didn't put that in your animation, correct? Correct. If that was in your animation, it would show the Toyota avoiding a vehicle by going to the left and then coming back in, correct? Possibly. Were you aware um, that um, when Mr. Porter arrived at the accident scene that there were already vehicles stopped there? Don't know who Mr. Porter is. So, do you know who the first person on the accident scene was? No. You said um, that in your in your direct testimony that you would expect in a kind of a head-on collision type scenario, you would expect a driver to you know, bail to the right, correct? Yes. But drivers don't always bail to the right, correct? No. Sometimes they bail to the left. Correct. Does the experience of the driver, are you aware, have anything to do with whether somebody might bail to the right or bail to the left? I'm not aware of any specific research on that, but it certainly could exist. The braking action that you uh, showed, you know, the, went, the brake was, it seemed like, I think, 30% applied, and then it kind of went off a little bit, and then to maximum, at the right at the end. Do you remember that testimony? Uh, the, in the testimony or the animation? No, in the um, in the testimony, where you're yes. talking about the yes. Pascals, I think you were talking yes. about. Right. Um, is that the is that have to do with the anti-lock braking that it comes on and then goes off a little bit and then goes on again? Uh, that I don't know enough about. I'd have to research more about the Toyota. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. Any you direct? Just briefly. Do you sorry, I do. I'm sorry. Um, I'll show you what's been marked as Exhibit D for identification. And can I see what you're? Sorry, uh, Sorry. Thank you. I ask you if you recognize this document. Yes. And what is that? That is Sergeant Ballinger's report. Uh, I could just have you read um, the kind of the first. Uh, well, might that report refresh your recollection about uh, Ms. Farr's statement? 
Yes. Right. Why don't you review the first paragraph under synopsis and tell me if it refreshes your recollection about Ms. Farr's statement about how many vehicles she passed. Yes, it indicates two. Okay. Zach, you remember now that Ms. Farr, in, at least in uh, Trooper Ballinger's report, said she had passed two vehicles at the rest area? Yes. Gary, do you know where the, do you recognize this? Yes. Right. Um, and could you tell me where the southbound rest, could you point to where the southbound rest area is on I-89 in this, in this map? I think it's right there. All right. So my, my 80, uh, mile 82, correct? Yes. And the crash was right around uh, mile 81? Yes. And um, I'm pointing to kind of mile 80, that's kind of the turn in the crest of French Hill? Uh, if my memory is sort of bending, it's a little beyond the crest. I think, it's, I think that's a, a down the slope there in travel itself. All right. Thank you. Do you need I do. That's all I have to do. I'm sorry. <laughs> Soren said, you see a little sticker here, it says far. Yes. Okay, and um, if you were to assume that Ms. Farr testified here in court and um, told the jury where the defendant passed her and put the sticker there, does that, um, does that indicate to you where, how close the defendant must have passed her? Right before the crash. Yes. Thank you. And I'm all set. Not yet. Just give me a minute. Just need to get back to the podium. You can set. Oh, I'm great. <laughs> so, Mr. Uh, Kingdom has talked about all sorts of possibilities, cars in the lane, and, and everything. Um, Based on your investigation and your calculations and your conclusions, um, do you feel confident that the animation you created represents all of the investigation and calculations and conclusions that you reached? Yes, I do. Did you need anything else in order to arrive at the calculations and, and conclusions? Or did um, you feel you had enough information to create that animation? The only other thing that I needed was the statement from Aaron Farr. And you got that? Yes. Thank you. Just, just briefly, Judge. Um, Ms. Farr, are you aware, says that she passes the, uh, she passes the Tacoma, um, and that, well, do you aware that Ms. Farr said she first saw the lights of the Tacoma coming up? Uh, French Hill, remember her saying I, that? I think so. Okay. And that she then, um, but you remember Ms. Farr said she didn't see the accident, correct? I, I don't recall. If, if just in when you uh, had me read the report, I think it said that she didn't look in your rearview mirror. So if, <clears throat> again, assuming as Ms. Harden just did, um, if Ms. Farr said that she saw the lights coming up French Hill and then went down French Hill and didn't see the accident, um, she really couldn't have been right here when she passed the Tacoma, correct? Your Honor, I, 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 would, I would object. That was for a question for Ms. Farr when she was here, but there were no questions. So I'll just take that. Nothing else, Judge. Thank you. Nothing. Thank you. All You can step down. Thank you.
morning, Officer Shepard. Good morning. Can you please state your name and spell your last name for the jury, please? Yes, it's Eric Shepard. It's E-R-I-C-S-H-E-P-A-R-D. Great, thank you. And how are you employed? I'm employed by the Town of Williston Police Department. How long have you been employed with Williston? Uh, since March of 2009. Okay. And is that the same amount of time you've been a police officer? Yes, ma'am. Were you employed with Williston then on October 8th of 2016? Yes, ma'am. And at some point that evening, did you get called to Interstate 89? Yes, ma'am. Where were you when you first got that call? I was parked in the parking lot of the Vermont State Police Barracks on 2A in Williston. Okay. And is that uh, location fairly close to the interstate entrances? Yes. It's uh, There's a convenience store next to the barracks and then the on ramps. Okay. Thank you. And what call did you receive? Dispatch put out a report of a uh, vehicle traveling the wrong way on I-89. Okay. And did you, in fact, respond to that call? I did. And is Interstate 89 a public highway? It is. It is open to general flow of traffic. Okay. And were you aware at the time of this call and you were responding to it whether anybody else in law enforcement was responding to the same call? Yes, my partner, Sergeant Claffey, who was parked next to me at the barracks, was also responding, uh, as was a member of Vermont State Police who had initially gotten dispatched to it. Okay. And which way did you both get on the interstate? I, I got on and proceeded to go southbound. I'm not sure which way Sergeant Claffey went initially. Okay. And did you know at the time that you were getting on the interstate what the location of the wrong way vehicle was? Approximately exit 11, which would be the Richmond exit. Okay, so you got on the interstate going towards the wrong way driver. That's correct. And did you ultimately learn uh, the location of the vehicle? Yes, I had uh, gotten to the uh, Williston rest area southbound. Um, I slowed down and actually pulled in the right lane and had folks try to duck off into the rest areas before, and I didn't want to overshoot it. So I slowed down, got in the right lane, and was checking the rest area to see if anyone was there. When they informed me of additional information. And what was that additional information? That there had been a crash approximately one mile from my location. Okay. And so, did you, what did you do next? Did you proceed towards the crash? Yeah, I immediately activated my blue lights and siren and proceeded towards the crash. Okay. And had, did you have any other, you said you had your blue lights on. Did you have any other lights on your vehicle? Yeah, I have a, I have a white light that is sort of unique to my vehicle. It, uh, I do commercial vehicle inspections, so I had a, installed a floodlight that both is a flood and flash uh, combo, and that's it's very bright and it's used to illuminate and a large scene for me, so I can do an inspection uh, late at night. Okay, and you said that that light on your vehicle is unique to your police cruiser at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, DMV has a couple of that are different but similar, but no, no other patrol car on the road has that. Okay. Did anybody else ever drive this particular police cruiser? It was assigned to Officer Daniel and myself. Okay, so only the two of you? Correct. And uh, did Williston Police Department, as part of your duties, give you the you and Officer Ganyo the exclusive rights to use that car? Yes, ma'am. Okay. How long had you been uh, using that vehicle? Approximately October of 2014 is when we put that vehicle into service. So two years prior to this incident? Yes. Okay. And how quickly did you arrive on scene from the time you heard that there was a crash to actually arriving? 30 seconds or so. Okay. Because you were around the rest area at the time, That's right? That's correct, yep. Okay. And so tell us what you uh, what you observed immediately upon arrival. Uh, immediately in the passing lane, I observed a vehicle, a truck that had been involved in a major collision. Um, and then I also inside the median, the grass area, I observed a vehicle that was on fire. And as I stepped out of my vehicle, people were yelling that there were people trapped inside of that vehicle. Okay. And what was, once you arrived on scene, what was the first thing that you did? I opened the hatch of the uh, vehicle, opened up the box we have in the back where the fire extinguisher is, and retrieved that and began to uh, run down the vehicle. Okay. And did you, in fact, get down to the vehicle that was on fire? Yes, ma'am. And did you attempt to extinguish the fire? I did. I started right at the engine compartment, right at the source, and tried to knock everything down as best I could. And were you successful? No. It's very tough to knock out a vehicle fire with a uh, smallish fire extinguisher, unfortunately. Okay. And while you were attempting to extinguish the fire, did something else catch your attention? 
Yeah, I, my, the blue lights from my cruiser caught my attention. I noticed that they were no longer in what we call the park mode, where the, they're mostly uh, steady blue. I noticed that they were flashing blue and white, which means the vehicle was in drive. Okay, so that didn't involve ch actually changing the light at all, pushing a button or anything. It's just what happens when you start the vehicle starts to move. Just put it right in drive. As soon as it drops into drive, uh, the lights will change. It will go from a steady, steady blue to a very attention-getting blue and white. Okay, thank you. And so when you saw that your blue lights changed, indicating that your vehicle was moving, what did you do? I asked who has my car. Okay. And again, kind of, how did you know that somebody had your car? Because uh, it had, it was moving, creeping slowly, and the lights had changed, and I kind of made a sound, kind of like, huh, thinking, oh man, I left my car in drive for a second, and went, oh, this is not the time for that. Right. Okay. And did anybody respond to you asking who had your car? No, no. And I said it again. Okay. No response. And so, what happened next? Uh, the vehicle picked up pace, at which point I realized somebody had stolen my vehicle, uh, so I immediately radioed that to dispatch. Okay. Did you do anything to attempt to run after the cruiser? I'm not a very good runner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you radioed that your cruiser had been stolen? A radio is much better resource and use to, uh, than uh, me trying to run. Okay. And... <coughs> Did you, at the time that you saw this happening, were you still down at the vehicle that was on fire? Yes, I had taken a couple steps away just to kind of get a better vantage point because there was a little bit of an elevation change. Okay. And were you able to observe anyone inside the vehicle? Yes, I observed uh, four persons inside of the vehicle. Okay. And were you able to gain access to the vehicle? No, I desperately tried. I tried quite a few of the door handles. I tried uh, from inside one of them. Tried banging on the windows, couldn't. I was trying to yell, get out, get out, get out. Okay. And when you say that you tried to open them, did you physically try to open the doors with the handles? Yes. And were they were they all locked? Yes. And when you said you tried to open one of them from the inside, how were you able to do that? I tried. I tried reaching in, and uh, the rear driver's side door, either the window had been down or was smashed out. And I reached in and tried to grab it. it. It was rather toasty, so I was unable to get a hold of it and, and open it. Okay. And you said that you were yelling. Were you yelling at the occupants? Is that? Yes, I was yelling, "Get out! Get out! Get out of the car! You know, hurry up!" Anything I could do to get some attention and convey my sense of urgency. And was that successful? It was not. And at some point, did you become aware that your partner, Sergeant Clappy, had arrived on scene? Yes. And how were you aware of that? Um, he, he advised, uh, he was coming up, and I told him to continue on, don't, don't stop. Okay, and how did he advise that? Uh, over the radio. Okay, and can you just explain a little bit, it doesn't look like you have it on, can you just explain to the jury kind of how that works? Yep, uh, typically, I, I'm not in my regular uniform, typically we'd have a, a portable and it would have a mic piece that would be attached to my vest up here, um, and then I would be able to hear all the transmissions, I could key it up and also relay stuff. Okay, so it's kind of on your shoulder. Yep, I typically wear it, I, if I had my actual vest on, I would wear it right here so I could hear everything. Okay. And so can you just say again what you told um, Sergeant Claffey when he arrived? I told him to continue on. There was, there was nothing he could do to assist me, um, and I knew that other people were coming. I, my priority then uh, was to send him after the car and figure that piece out. Um, him and I have worked together a very long time, and we trust each other, and I know that I could handle what I needed to, and he could handle what he needed to and divvy that up. Okay. And so what did you do next? Did you return to the vehicle? Yes. And did you observe anything else outside of the vehicle that you could tend to? Yeah, so the vehicle at that point, I, there was no hope of me trying to do anything with the vehicle. Um, I did observe a female's body outside of the vehicle that my focus went towards. Okay. And how did you, what was your focus? What did you do? Uh, Myself and an off-duty uh, deputy sheriff both uh, took over and moved her away from the burning vehicle, um, and then some other folks tried to render aid. Okay. And so while you were down there rendering aid, were 
did something happen that, again, kind of changed your focus? Yes, uh, Sergeant Claffey aired that the uh, vehicle was coming back at me uh, at over 100 miles an hour going the wrong way. Okay, um, probably obvious, but did that concern you? Uh, most definitely. And what was your primary concern at the time? When I looked up at the roadway, I saw uh, about a dozen people milling about either trying to help, assist, or just in the way of the interstate. So my next priority was to get everyone off of the interstate so they weren't going to get hit or killed. Okay. And you said about a dozen or so people. Do you recall about how many cars had stopped at that point? There was a long line of cars extending from the scene all the way down towards the rest area, the better part of a mile, but I couldn't count Okay. Do you know whether most of those vehicles were in the travel lane or if they had pulled into a breakdown lane? It was a mix of both. Okay. And so what did you do with that information? Sorry, when um, you heard Sergeant Claffey say that the cruiser was coming back towards the scene at over 100, what was your next step? I, I, first, I cleared the interstate of as many people as I possibly could. I yelled, screamed, whatever it, whatever it took to get the interstate clear. Um, and then I tried to find my safest spot to take a position, which was I, I used the wrecked truck, uh, took a couple steps back from it and a couple steps towards the median, so if something collided with it, it would not collide with me, um, and then drew my firearm. Okay. And you said the wrecked truck, like the truck that was involved in the initial collision? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so at some point, did you see the, did you see your cruiser coming? I could hear it before I could see it. It was definitely engine to the max. Okay. And what did you first see? <laughs> I saw that bright white light that uh, was on the front of my vehicle. Okay. So you knew that it was your vehicle coming back? Without a shadow of a doubt. Okay. And at that time, were the blue lights on? No, the blue lights were not on. Okay. And so did you, you said you drew your firearm. Did you dry, draw your firearm because you were considering firing at your cruiser? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And what decision did you ultimately make about firing at it? I had a, just enough time to think that through and, and vehicle that was going 100 miles an hour, shooting from an angle, plus I saw some folks in the background. It just, it wasn't worth the possibility of that. And then an uncontrolled vehicle uh, at 100 miles an hour and an incapacitated driver probably would not have been the wisest. Okay. And do you recall what lane the cruiser was in coming back into the scene? You know, from my vantage point, to me, it looked like it was straddling uh, dead center. However, when I watched my video, it's, it's slightly more in the um, in the passing lane. But from my vantage point, to me, it was dead center of the interstate. Okay. And was it swerving or was it following a direct path? A direct path. Okay. And what did the cruiser do? Uh, the cruiser struck the truck that was initially involved in the first collision that was in the middle of the passing lane. Okay. And at some point, did you observe the operator of your cruiser vehicle? Yes, it was a rather eerie experience. As the two vehicles collided, time, time slowed. Time slowed to almost nothing. And I was able to kind of track the vehicle as it, as it moved forward. And I actually watched the operator get ejected out the driver's side window was something that will stick with me. That was a very, very bizarre thing to watch. Yeah. And you had never seen something like that before? Absolutely not. And I hope never again to see that. Sure. Um, were you able to observe in this in this moment what the operator was wearing? Yeah, it was like a burnt orange or dark orangey type uh, sweatshirt. Okay. And did you see where the operator landed when he was ejected? Yeah, it was strange. I was able to follow Time slowed, and I was able to follow him right out of the vehicle, right into a couple feet into the media, about 20 feet where the car ended up. Okay. And did you first approach the individual or your police cruiser? Uh, no, I, I started with my cruiser. I was concerned that there might be somebody else inside the cruiser, so I had my firearm out still and pointed it at the cruiser to ensure nobody was inside of the vehicle. Um, walked up to the vehicle, checked, nobody was inside the vehicle. Okay. And what was the condition of the cruiser? Uh, completely totaled. The vehicle was, uh, the engine had been ripped to shreds pretty good, um, and it was now starting to smol <coughs> smolder at that point. Okay. And so did you then approach the person who had been ejected from the cruiser? Yes. I immediately turned my attention to the 
first would have been ejected. And what did you observe about this person? Uh, he was laying on the ground, uh, looked to be in a, a little bit of pain. And were you able to, could you see his face? Yes, I, I was yelling, stop, police, don't move, show me your hands, anything. This typical stuff that they teach you to, to say to folks to get gain compliance. Okay, and to be clear, you were yelling this at him? I had no voice left at the end of the night, so okay. yes. And you had your firearm pointed at him while you were yelling? Oh, yes. Most and definitely. do you know whether he saw you? There's no missing me. We were fairly close to proximity, by 20 feet apart, yelling at the top of my lungs, and he was looking in my direction. So. Okay. And did he comply with <clears throat> your demands? Yes. Okay. Was he saying anything? No, I, it was a little bit of groan or grunt as if pain, but no, no words at all. Okay. And were you, in fact, able to take him into custody? I knew at that point, once, once that car had struck right next to me and it was kind of, there was a lot of stuff going on in my head, I knew I wasn't going to have the dexterity to get the handcuffs out and do that. So I, I just held him at gunpoint until uh, a trooper Miller arrived and he was able to take custody of him. And so once he was handcuffed, did you move him from that location? Yeah, we, we stepped him away just a little bit because the cruiser was now starting to burn and we didn't need anyone else getting hurt. Okay. And did you stay with that individual? I did not. I stepped away. Okay. And what else did you do? Um, eventually, Williston Fire showed up. They handed me a, fire, a larger fire extinguisher and I attempted to put out the flames from my <coughs> cruiser. So I am first going to show you what have been marked as states 15, 16, and 17. Do you recognize these photos? Yes, these are the photos of uh, my burned out cruiser after the fire had been put out. Okay. Are those a fair and accurate depiction of what your cruiser looked like after this crash? Yes. taken at that night? Um, I do believe so. And so, from what you can tell, what is this a picture of? That would be my uh, bird out cruiser. State 16? Same, same picture. Or same, just different angle. And state 17? The same. And who in your department is responsible for buying and sort of outfitting the cruisers in at Williston Police Department. I'm the one that's responsible with the uh, guidance or approval of my supervisor and the chief. Okay. So are you pretty intimately aware or familiar of the value of these vehicles? Yes, ma'am. And can you describe uh, the ultimate damage to your vehicle? I believe the uh, insurance company ended up giving us a check for $59,053 and some odd cents. Your Honor, at this time, I would enter a stipulation into the record, which is States 83. Members of the jury, the state and the defendant, Stephen Burgoyne, have agreed that you may find certain facts. This is called a stipulation. The damage to the Williston Police Department cruiser, initially being driven by Officer Eric Shepard and then crashed by Stephen Burgoyne on October 8, 2016, was valued at $59,053.26. As with any evidence in this trial, you must decide what weight you will give this stipulation.
Officer Shepard, do you know Stephen Burgoyne? Yes, ma'am. How did you know him before this night? Yes, ma'am. How did you know him? Uh, we had a prior law enforcement encounter. Okay. And did you see Stephen Burgoyne on the night of this incident? Yes, ma'am. What role did he play in uh, this event? He was the person that was ejected from my uh, vehicle. Okay. And do you see Stephen Burgoyne in the courtroom today? Yes, he's sitting in the defendant's chair. And does he look the same today as he did in October of 2016? Uh, no, he was substantially thinner. Okay. Any other differences? Uh, the hair, uh, much shorter, everything, facial hair, everything. Okay. Are you still sure that this is the man that took your cruiser and was later ejected from it? That's not a face-off for yet. Thank you. Did, on, on October 8th at any point, did you give Stephen Burgoyne permission to operate your cruiser? Absolutely not. Have you had an opportunity to view your, your cruiser video from this incident? Yes, ma'am. So the jury has already seen it um, once when uh, Sergeant Claffey was testifying, so it has been previously admitted as State's 18. But I have a couple of questions for you, and then we're going to watch it again, okay? Okay. Specifically, upon arrival, does the video show you exiting your vehicle? Uh, yeah, it, it will see me walking away. It doesn't see me actually stepping out of the car due to the angle, but it, you'll see me going down to the, uh, the vehicle. Okay. And it, does it show an individual coming up from the median? Yes, ma'am. Where the burning vehicle was? Yes, ma'am. And does the video show that same person coming towards your cruiser? Yes, ma'am. Have you identified the person in the cruiser video coming up from the median? Do you know who that person is? Yes, ma'am. That would be the defendant, Stephen Burgoyne. And how do you know that? Um, you can see him fairly clearly. And get, he gets up close, same top, same reddish orange <coughs> top. Um, and he's the only one that entered the vehicle and he's the only one that exited. And after he enters the after he enters the cruiser, do you see it start to move? Yes, ma'am. Can you explain to the jury a little bit more with your radio of how this, the cruiser radio shows the cruiser leave, but you can still they can still hear you um, on your radio? Yes, there's two ways, actually. Um, our cruisers are equipped with uh, what we call body mics or VLP mics. We actually carry that on our vest, and it's a wireless microphone, so that way when you want a traffic stop or doing something else, you can still hear our, our audio is being captured, as is anyone else around us, so we can later use that, or if somebody made a complaint about us, we could review that and actually hear what the officer had to say. So there's actually audio from that. It's a limited range, but it's fairly decent. And then also I have my, my portable um, on me so I can communicate with dispatch, and you, know, if you can actually hear that from inside the cruiser as well, because there's obviously a cruiser mounted radio as well. So just a couple of quick still frames from your video before we start. Um, they heard a little bit about this, um, again, from Sergeant Claffey and what all of this information depicts. Can you tell from this, um, from this still frame what lights you had activated when you started going towards the scene? Yep, the, uh, all of the overhead blue lights were on. Um, if you look there, it says triggers where it's highlighted. Uh, if all of the overhead blue lights are on, that, that where it says lights to the left of that will be red. And then also my siren was on, and that's indicated by that uh, red dot there to the left of siren. Okay. And again, that light button is uh, referring to the blue lights as well? That's correct. It's referring to the, when all of the blue lights are on in the vehicle. And if the blue lights get shut off, that light goes away? Correct. Like where it says brakes, it's empty there, so that means I'm not pressing the brakes. Okay. And do, does the, the red beside the lights get sh shut off in this, in this video? Yes, later on. And can you tell us when that happens? Uh, about 37 seconds or so after the vehicle is stolen, that light goes away and you see no more reflection of blue lights. Okay, so I'm going to show you a still frame of when the lights go out. And is this what you're referring to? It is. And can you tell the jury how, actually, before I start, I'll show you what have been previously marked as states 91 and 92. 
you recognize these? Yes, this is the uh, current setup in the center console for the vehicle that replaced the Burke vehicle. Are they the same? Is it the same console setup as it was? Yeah, it's I since I'm the one that does most of the, the upfitting work, I and it was my car, I, I set it up exactly the same. I wiped the setup, so Okay. Uh, the state can move ninety one and ninety two and Evans. Any objections? No objections. Ninety one and ninety two are admitted. So I'm gonna show you what has now been admitted as states ninety one. Can you explain to the jury what this is? Sure, so the, the top part is actually the uh, radio. That's where it says zone one local. Uh, and then the microphone for the radio is that big thing that says mobile one on the right. And what we're discussing is the next panel down. That's the, uh, that's the controller for the siren and for the lights. Okay. And do they look different at night? They do. Um, those buttons are actually, they're, they're clear during the day, but at night they glow green. And then when one of those are active, there's actually uh, the dot above them will actually glow red. Okay. So in this photograph, none of the lights or siren are on, is that correct? That is correct. One of the little lights would have been red if that was the case? Absolutely. And so looking at the bottom left corner of this picture, the, the one, two, and three, was it your yeah. test? Did you say that's the siren? No, that's, that's mean, for the lights. The blue lights? Yep, that's for the blue lights. So it's a four position uh, slide controller. Position, what we call position zero, is position off, which is where it is right now. And then as you progressively flip it, uh, you get more and more lights as you go across. And then you'll see where it says one, two, three, just below that. It will light up red for what level the lights are on. Okay. So <coughs> when Stephen Borgoyne got into your cruiser, what lights would have been? Red. Uh, number three, and that slide switch would have been all the way to the right. And that's it? Yes. Okay. And so in order for Mr. Burgoyne to have turned off the blue lights, he would not have had to push a button, is that correct? Correct. It would have just been the slide switch that got. He would have slid this switch on the bottom left from three to zero. Yes, ma'am. off. Okay. <coughs> What about the white light that you have on your on your cruiser? Would that have been controlled with this? No, it, it's rather bright, and I, I didn't want somebody to accidentally turn on and blind people, so I sort of hid the switch. Okay, so he would not have been able to turn that light off. Correct. And can you tell by viewing your cruiser video and that side taskbar that's on the side, whether any of these other buttons were pushed while Stephen Burgoyne was operating the cruiser? So the top row is all the siren functions. If you if you had pressed any of those, the siren trigger would have come on. You would have seen the little red dot next to that. Um, there's two buttons on the, the lower panel that would have actually emitted a beep, uh, an audible beep, and you would have heard that on the cruiser mic. And then any of the other ones would have caused other lights to flash that you would have seen in the video. Okay. so. Is it your opinion that none of those other buttons, having viewed all of that, that none of those other buttons were pushed? The only possible button would have been the override button, which wouldn't have done anything. That would have been the one button okay. uh, that I couldn't testify to saying that that was or wasn't. Okay. Any other so, button we would have noticed. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12. So the other 17 buttons, you're confident were not pressed? Correct. So next and finally, I am going to show you what have been marked as states 19 through 26. Do you recognize this series of photos? Yes, these are still shots from my, from my cruiser camera upon arrival. Okay, and having seen your video and seen those, are those a fair and accurate depiction of the sequence? Yes, ma'am. State would move 19 to 26 into evidence. No objection. No objection. No, no. Thank you. All right, I'm just going to go through these with you briefly. Starting with states 19, can you actually grab that pointer right in front of you and 
point out in here where Stephen Burgoyne is? Is it not working? <laughs> Why don't you just describe it? All the way to the left, you see NW14 right there. That's Mr. Burgoyne. Okay. And? Same, he, he's coming a little closer. This date's 21. Again, a little closer. It's gotten a little washed out. If you watch the video in sequence, you can see him continuing that as well. Okay, this date's 22. Same deal. And watching the video and looking at these um, still frames, can you tell which angle uh, Mr. Burgoyne is facing while he's having this from the time he goes to the median to the time he's in the cruiser? Yeah, initially you see him walk kind of straight up, starts to walk away from the, walk towards the cruiser, and then as soon as you see me, he faces away from me. Okay, and then once you, does he at some point change direction again? I barely make it past him, and he starts uh, moving fairly quickly for my cruiser. Okay. So, in this video, is that you on the left and Mr. Burgoyne on the right? Yes, and that's that's a depiction that I spoke about where he's faced away from me and then I'm running down in the median. Um, I never even made any contact. Okay, and again, uh, after what, when they watch the video again, is it your testimony that he's initially facing the cruiser and then the moment you are coming towards him, towards the median, he faces away from you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then once you're out of view to go down to the burning vehicle, he turns back towards the cruiser. Yes, ma'am. And if you can tell right there, he's uh, going at a pretty good clip. Again, is that him at the end? Yes. All right, we're going to watch the video, and then I have just two more questions for you.
Intoxicated, elderly, unfamiliar with the area. That's generally any of the ones I've interceded. Okay. I think previously you told me uh, unfamiliar with the language. Yeah, unfamiliar with the area or the language, yes. Okay, so. um, you, you say you were at the scene about 30 seconds after the report of the accident? Approximately. And well, when your cruiser came back and was in the accident, you said it was smoldering at first, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. And then it uh, caught fire? Yes, sir. Um, and then when you uh, went down the median at first, when you first arrived on scene, the, the car was already on fire, though, correct? You're referring to the Jetta? Je yeah, the Jetta now. I've switched yes, cars. Yes, All right. Um, and... Uh, when you went down, the fire was in the engine compartment? Uh, it, it was starting in the engine compartment. It was licking out of the engine compartment and out of the uh, uh, console area. So it was already had already penetrated into the occupant's area. Okay. But you could see into the occupant's area? The fire was rather bright and illuminated. It. Okay. Um, and you saw the four occupants in the vehicle, correct? Yes, sir. And you said one of, at least one of the... Um, windows was either shattered or open. Yes, sir. And how about the others? I'm not sure. And you tried, um, uh, you said a couple of the doors? Uh, All of the doors in due time. I started with the front passenger's door, and then the rear passenger door, and then I went to the front driver's door, and then the rear driver's door. And you were unable to open any of those doors? Correct. And The lights, um, the red light that was on that indicated that that slide was on three and so your cruiser blue lights were on, did I get that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and so, um, and then to turn them off, you just slide it to the left. Correct. You have to slide it three positions to yeah. position zero. And that would turn that red light off. Yes, sir. I don't have anything else, Judge. Thank you. Can you redirect? Just one question. Officer Shepard, Mr. Keenum's asked you if it was common to have people get on the interstate the wrong way, correct? Correct. Have you had an experience where an individual got on the interstate the right way and then stopped in the middle of the highway, did a three-point turn, and headed northbound? 
Not to my knowledge. Typically, we just get a report of somebody driving the wrong way. Any of the cases I've investigated, that has not been the case. Is it typical or common that individuals just get on the interstate the wrong way? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? No okay, you can step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your